Wolf, and we are continuing to read Blood on the River, Jamestown 1607 by Elisa Carbone, and we are on to chapter 22. Captain Smith, you shall find Powhatan to use you kindly, but trust him not, for he hath sent for you only to cut your throats. Chief of the Werascoyaks, quoted in William Simmons' edition, The Proceedings. Our trouble starts when winter sets in. If we had more skilled farmers and hunters, and if we all worked at farming and hunting, we might be able to produce enough food to get us through the winter. But as it is, our men are kept busy searching for gold, digging sassafras, and making clapboards, glass, pitch, tar, and soap ashes to ship back to England, in the hopes that something in their lot will make a profit for the Virginia Company. And to make things worse, when Captain Newport leaves in December, he takes a lot of our food stores with him, saying he and his sailors will need them for the long voyage home. At least he takes Captain Ratcliffe as well, and rids us of him. When our barrels are close to empty, Captain Smith goes to trade with the natives for grain, but he comes back empty-handed. Chief Powhatan has commanded all of his tribes not to trade with us. He is wielding his power, says Captain Smith. He is showing us that the crowning ceremony angered him, and that his power is not diminished by it. We will see what else he plans to do. We are allowed one cup of grain each per for each person each day. I am always hungry. I often think of the feast at Werowokomoko, and wish I were there again. Richard and I dig up sassafras root to chew on to ease our hunger. Then we talk about food, trying to use our minds to fill our bellies. My mum used to make Yorkshire pudding at Christmas time. I say, with the crust just a little brown and loads of gravy. Richard closes his eyes, imagining. And remember All Saints' Day at the orphanage? He asks. When we had stew with enough meat in it so everybody, everyone got some? We talk about the birds and fish we roasted on Nevis, and I tell him again about the mounds of peas, squash, and venison at the Werowokomoko feast. Soon our jaws are tired from chewing on the sassafras roots, and for a time our bellies are fooled into thinking we have eaten. Then one day we have good news, or what seems like good news. Two natives arrive to tell us that Captain, that Chief Powhatan is ready to trade. He will give us food if we bring him what he wants, a groinstone, a rooster, and a hen, copper beads, fifty swords, several muskets, and workmen to build him an English-style house. He knows we are hungry enough that Captain Smith might well give him all he wants, including the weapons. President Smith rubs his forehead and says quietly, We are desperate for the food. To the messengers in Algonquin, he says, Tell Chief Powhatan we come. Give him, give things he wants. But as the messengers walk away, he says in English, Except the guns and swords. I will throw in some extra gifts instead. I smile, watching the battle of wills between Captain Smith and Chief Powhatan is like watching the dance of a sword fight between two proud, powerful men. We load up two barges, and the discovery for the trip to Werowokomoko. We hope to find all, to bring all three of the vessels back, laden with food. The first night, we stop at the Werascoyak village, and are welcomed as guests. Chief Sassantikum shares his pipe of tobacco with Captain Smith, and shares some advice as well. I listen hard to understand the Algonquin words. Chief Powhatan will treat you kindly, but do not trust him, he says. He is sent for you only to slit your throat. 
Captain Smith does not seem surprised, and I realise he has already guessed that this might be a trap. We keep guns ready, he says in his choppy Algonquin. Then he looks at me. I leave boy with you, he asks Chief Assassin Tekum. I'll, I send messenger to him. If I dead, boy go to Jamestown, tell others. This chills me to my bones. I want to object, to tell Captain Smith not to go. Why is he willingly walking into a trap? We are surviving on our grain, I want to tell him. Captain Newport will be back soon. Let us all return to Jamestown tomorrow and wait for the supply ship. But I don't say anything. It is not my place. Chief Sassenticum agrees. Captain Smith and the other men will go on to Werewakamoko in the morning. I will stay in the Werascoyak village and wait. If Captain Smith is killed, I will return to Jamestown to bring the news. The next morning, I watch the Discovery sail away with Captain Smith at her helm. I wonder if it will be the last time I see him. I push down sadness. I have already lost Reverend Hunt. I don't want to lose Captain Smith as well. I tell myself that he is wily and smart and will not easily be fall into Chief Powhatan's trap. The Weras Koyak village is a busy place, and I want to do my share of the work, but when I try to help two girls with their pounding of corn into meal, Kainta, Chief Sassenticum's son, pulls me away. That work is for the women to do, he says. I will show you men's work. He takes me into the forest. There is a thin layer of snow on the dead leaves, and my feet crunch loudly on them. He stops and looks at me, frowning. You are very loud, he says. He inspects my shoes. My mother will make you moccasins. He looks around, finds a sapling that seems to be just right for what he is searching for, and cuts it down with his hatchet. I will teach you to how to make a bow and arrows he says. Working with wood and stone is a good way to keep my mind off of what might be happening to Captain Smith. Kainta teaches me how to peel the bark off the sapling, cut notches for the bowstring, and string it with strong gut. We make several arrow shafts from straight thin wood. He shows me how to make an arrowhead, chipping a piece of rock until it is the right shape. It is a slow process, and I ruin several pieces of rock before I get it right. But finally, I am able to make my first arrowhead. Then I tie it to a shaft and balance the shaft with feathers so that it will shoot straight. When we grow hungry, we go to the communal cook fire. There, is a, there we find a large clay pot filled with hominy and venison stew, fish on the grill, and bed, bread baking in the hot ashes on the ground. Eat, says Kainta. He tears off a piece of bread and uses an oyster shell to scoop stew right out of the pot. I do the same. It is delicious. This is what I have seen people do all day. Just come up to the pot and take what they want to eat. I realize that they have no meal times, no rationing of food. And I think that these Powhatan people must be the wealthiest people on the earth. A young woman comes to put a new loaf of bread in the ashes and to stir the pot of stew. She wears a kind of apron made of deer skin that hangs down to her knees. Her arms, face and legs have colourful tattoos of patterns, flowers, fruits and snakes. Her black hair is plaited into one long braid hanging down to her hips. She smiles slyly at, shyly at me. How strange I must look to her in my English clothes. No messenger comes that day, or the next. I don't know if this is good news or bad. I have no choice but to wait. At sunrise I go with Kainta down to the river where he bathes in the frigid water. I stay shivering on the shore. Kainta sprinkles a bit of tobacco on the river, closes his eyes and lifts his hands, and I know he is praying. This is 
what Namantak did each morning when he lived with us in Jamestown. The days go by, and I learn more about men's work, which is mostly hunting and fishing. I am also careful to learn which chores are women's work, so that I will not embarrass myself again by trying to do any of it. Planting, weeding, harvesting, making clay pots, cooking, making food, it is all for the women and gir the girls and women to do. Kainta teaches me how to make a knife by chipping a piece of rock until it is sharp, then tying it with gut to a, onto a short stick. He gives me a boxskin pouch and shows me how to hang it from my waist with a leather strap. My knife fits ni nicely inside. I continue to make my arrows, chipping the arrowheads and tying the feathers, until I have enough to go hunting. Kainta shows me how to weave a case so I can carry my arrows on my back. He has me practice with my bow and arrows and a target until I can shoot straight. It snows. Kainta says this will make hunting even easier, because we will see the animal's tracks in the snow. I have my new moccasins and I walk carefully, heel to toe, the way he has shown me trying to be as silent as he is. I am concentrating so hard that at first I do not notice someone else who has been walking quietly in the forest. Then suddenly I look up and see him. Namantak! I cry out. I am very happy to see him. Then, when I realize why he has come, I am filled with fear. He is the messenger from where Wakamoko. I stand, gripping my bow, waiting for bad news. Namatak smiles. Do not look so worried, Samuel. Your master sends good wishes. I groan with relief. Then I am confused. Why have you come, and not Captain Smith? I ask him in English. He answers me in Algonquin. I am in his world now. Captain Smith says you will stay with the Werekos Koyaks through the winter. You will learn more of the language and eat well. Kainta joins us. He and Namantek exchange the greeting of countrymen, with one fist each t taps first his own chest, then forehead, and then taps the other boy's chest and forehead. Come, says Kainta, you must be hungry from your journey. We will hunt later. We sit with Namantek at the communal cook fire. As he eats, I form my questions in Algonquin. Chief Powhatan make trap? I ask him. Now that I have heard the good news, I am ready to hear the whole story. Yes, Namantuck says, but your werewants is quick as a rabbit. The trap did not catch him. He grins. He likes Captain Smith as much as I do. In between mouthfuls, Namantuck tells us what happened. Captain Smith and his men arrived in Werewakamoko and were treated kindly. They traded for lots of corn, but by the time their boats were loaded up, the tide was out, and the boats couldn't move. They had to spend the night at Werewakamoko, staying in one of the houses. Just before dark, Captain Smith heard a sound at the door. It was Pocahontas. Her eyes were wide with terror. You must go, she said. In a little, in a little while, my father's men will bring you food. As soon as you put your weapons down, and begin to eat, they will slit your throats with your own swords. And if they don't succeed, there will be a bigger attack later. She begged them to leave right away. She was crying. She knew that if she was caught warning Captain Smith, her father would have her put to death. She may have been play-acting the first time, I think. But this time, she really did risk her life to save Captain Smith. The tide was still too low for them to leave. Within an hour, ten strong warriors came with platters of food, just like Pocahontas had said they would. The warriors said the slow the warriors said the slow matches on the Englishmen's guns were smoking up the room, making them sick, and they should put them out. But Captain Smith just said, Oh, we don't mind the smoke. Then he made the warriors taste all the food to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Captain Smith and his men ate their supper with the guns smouldering and ready. And the bigger and later, the big attack? I ask. 
Namantek tells me how the Englishmen kept up a guard half the night, standing with their muskets ready. There never was an attack. At midnight the tide had risen enough to move the boats, and they left. So Captain Smith and his men are safe, and they have taken corn back to Jamestown. Thank you. Good news, I say to Namantek. It has begun to snow again, and Namantek is invited to stay the night. He sleeps in the family house with Kainta and me. The next day the three of us go hunting. We walk quietly through the white forest, stalking rabbits. We see one. Even I have been quiet enough not to startle it. Kainta and Namantek both look at me. They want me to shoot, to have a chance to make my first kill. Silently, I pull out an arrow and string it on my bow. I make my breath even and slow so that it will not affect my shot. I watch the rabbit as it hops along the undergrowth, looking for food. I pull back the bowstring and aim. Then I let the arrow fly. There's a whoosh and a thud. The arrow hits its mark. The hare lies still. Blood seeps out where my, where my arrow has entered its side, staining the snow bright red. Kainta claps me on the back. You have learned well, he says. I am still amazed at what I have done. Go, take your prize, and give thanks to God Ocheus for your meat, says Namatek. I tie the rabbit's hind feet to a piece of gut and hang it around my waist. We hunt some more, and the other two boys also get rabbits. The winter day is short. When the sun sinks down, casting long shadows over glittering snow, it is time to return to the village. I use my knife to cut open the rabbit's abdomen and clean out its entrails, and to peel the rabbit's skin away from the meat. My rabbit, which I have killed myself with a weapon I made myself, becomes part of the communal stew that evening. It makes me feel proud and strong. Namantek goes home to wear a wakamoko, and I stay at the Weresquayak village, as Captain Smith has prescribed. Kainta and I do more hunting. He shakes his head when he sees me trying to keep my hair, which is getting quite long, out of my way. He asks his mother to cut my hair for me. She, uses, she takes two mussel shells and grates away the hair on the right side of my head, down to the scalp. It pinches and pulls, but I keep still. On the other side she leaves it long, she, and she cuts the ridge of short hair down the middle of my head, so that my hair looks very much like the other men and boys. There, says Kainta, now it will not get caught in your bowstring. When the winds of February blow cold, I wear a mantle of deerskin. During the march, thaw, I kill my first wild turkey. Kainta ties two of its feathers into the long side of my hair. In late April, when the mosquitoes, flies, and gnats come out, Kainta shows me how, to, how a layer of bear grease mixed with a powder of red pocoon root keeps the bugs away. It also makes my skin red. I no longer look very much like an English boy. One day, we boys are playing a game that is much like English football. We have a goal at, the, at each end of the field, and we kick a ball made of skins, trying to score by kicking the ball into the other team's goal. I have finally gotten tired of sweating in my slops and long sleeve shirt during these games, and have let Kainta's sister make me a buckskin breechcloth to wear. The red pocoon dye protects my back, chest and arm, arms and legs from insects and the burning of the sun, and my moccasins protect my feet for running. The right side of my hair has been newly shaved by Kainta's mother, and the left side of my hair is quite long, almost to my shoulder. I've added a few shells to the feathers as ornaments. As we play, I hear a call of Wingapo! spoken with an English accent. I stop running. I have almost forgotten what English speech sounds like. What I see takes my breath away. It is Richard, Nathaniel, Henry, Abram, and several others. They look thin and warm. 
They are walking toward us. Richard calls out, speaking Algonquin as if he has memorized just what to say. Captain Smith send. Need eat. Find English boy Samuel. I sputter. Richard, I call to him. It's me. Richard's eyes go wide and his mouth drops open. By God, he turned into a savage, Henry says. I ignore Henry and go to greet Richard and the others. The Indian boys gather around us. Are you here to bring me back? I ask, still not understanding why they have come. Richard shakes his head. We're here to stay for a while, to eat. Rats got into the grain. There were so many of them, they looked like maggots squirming in the barrels. We have almost nothing left. So President Smith has sent us to different places. Some he sent up the river to live on oysters, some down the river to point comfort, to live on fish, and some to friendly tribes. We got sent here. We have copper to pay our way. I translate as best I can for Kayinta. He nods and says he will go tell his father that they are here. So, Richard eyes me curiously. Did that stuff just get stuck in your hair? Or did you put it there on purpose? I sock him playfully in the arm, and we both laugh. I think of how I want to teach him what I have learned. How to make snares to catch beavers, otters, and squirrels. How to build a fire in a canoe at night so the fish will be mesmerized and come close so we can spear them. How to find mushrooms and roots and berries that are good to eat. I know that with the knowledge I have gained from living with the Wares Koyaks, we don't ever have to be hungry again. And that is the end of chapter 22.